He did what? That was my first thought when I read the account of what this Marine did during World War II. When I was doing research for my next video, I came across the story of Captain Henry Hammer and Hank Elrod, a United States Marine stationed at Wake Island. What he did was something that is almost unheard of for a fighter pilot. Tell us more. But for a Marine, a Marine with the nickname Hammer and Hank, I guess nothing is ever unheard of. So who was Henry Elrod? Well, he was born in 1905 in Turner County, Georgia, and attended the University of Georgia and Yale prior to becoming a Marine. He went to the basic school at Philadelphia and then on to the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida, where he earned his wings in 1935. He then served in San Diego and Hawaii before being sent to Wake Island on 4 December 1941. You're probably asking yourself, what is Wake Island? I've never heard of it. And most people haven't. Wake Island is about a thousand miles west of Hawaii in the Northwestern Pacific Ocean. It measures less than three miles in total area. It's a very small piece of property with a lot of strategic value. The United States took possession of it in the early 20th century and used it for coastal defense, an airfield, and a seaplane base. Well, that's before the Japanese took it, along with 1,600 American troops and civilians who were on the island. Well, that's terrible, terrible. So now you know where Wake Island is and why the United States was there. So how does Henry Elrod fit in? So he arrives along with 12 aircraft, the F4F-3 Wildcat, 12 pilots, ground crews, and Major Paul A. Putnam, the commander of VMF-211. Things are going pretty well for about three and a half days. And then all hell breaks loose when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. It's only hours after that attack in Hawaii that the Japanese attack Wake Island. Now, for the Japanese and the United States, Wake Island and the airfield on it are of great strategic importance. The United States currently holds it, and the Japanese want it, and they want it in a bad way. On the morning of 8 December, a Marine who was watching the sky over the island in anticipation of an attack saw what looked like the outline of warships against the gray horizon. And while he's on the ground looking through his binoculars, Captain Elrod is in his Grumman-built Wildcat circling overhead. He hears over the radio the call to scramble all the fighters still on the ground. In addition to the ships, a group of low-flying fighter bombers could be seen heading their way. But things are about to get interesting. And so the fun begins. Now, Captain Elrod has two strikes against him before the battle even starts. He's all by himself over Wake, and he only has about half a tank of fuel left in the aircraft. But he did have one thing going for him. He was a Marine, and screwing with the United States Marines generally does not end well. <laughs> you guys are so screwed now! So, despite being outnumbered, Hammer and Hank engages the Japanese formation which numbered 22 aircraft made up of bombers and the A6M Zero. Now, even though it's 22 Japanese against one United States Marine, some would say the Japanese were outnumbered. Diving from above, Hank begins to open fire from the Wildcats' six Browning 50 caliber machine guns, which were mounted in the wings. While avoiding the return fire from the Japanese, Hammer and Hank did his best to disrupt the attack on his fellow Marines below. Hank was soon joined by three other Wildcats from his squadron. You see, despite having 12 airplanes originally, of the 11 that were still on the ground, only three remained operational. The others were still sitting on the ground in various states of disarray, having been knocked out of the fight before they could even get in the air. During the air battle, Captain Elrod scored two confirmed hits and damaged several other Japanese aircraft. It would be the first air-to-air -air kills of the war by a Marine. For sure, Hammer and Hank and his fellow Marines put a dent in the Japanese force looking to take Wake Island, and it certainly slowed them down. But the Marines were significantly outnumbered. For several days following the initial attack, 
the enemy shelled and bombarded the Marine positions. On the early morning of 11 December, the Japanese began their all-out assault on the island. Hank leapt up and ran to the fighter line towards one of only four operational Wildcats. This time, the Japanese assault consisted of almost a dozen destroyers that commenced bombarding the Marine positions along with troop transport ships. The Marines only had six artillery positions along the coast that returned fire. In Hammer and Hank, now airborne, his Wildcat strapped with a pair of 100-pound bombs began strafing runs on the Japanese ships. The enemy, not happy with being shot at, began to return fire on Hank and his two wingmen. Dozens of guns were now trained on the only three aircraft left of VMF-211. It wasn't long before one of the Japanese gunners scored a hit on Hank's Wildcat. The round found its way into and through the Wildcat's fuel line. Alarms let Hank know he had been hit. His fuel gauge let him know what had been hit. But the Wildcat and its Marine pilot still had some fight left in them. Hank lined up for one more pass, this time on the destroyer Kasaraji. Through an onslaught of anti-aircraft gunfire, he lined up the destroyer in his iron sights and released both the 100-pounders into the warship. The Japanese ship, which was carrying a double load of depth charges, exploded and burst into flames. Its hull cracked in half and the ship sank. Captain Elrod had just sank a destroyer, making him the first American fighter pilot to sink a warship during World War II. Let me say that again. Hammer and Hank sunk a destroyer. That is so badass. Even for a Marine, that's pretty damn impressive. So Hank was able to land safely before his aircraft ran out of fuel, and the Marines on Wake Island were able to repel the Japanese attack. But they would be back, and this time with reinforcements. On 23 December, the Japanese were back, and this time they brought with them a couple of aircraft carriers, two heavy cruisers, and more destroyers and escort ships. The Marines, by this point, no longer had any airworthy Wildcats, and reinforcements that were coming from Hawaii were at best several days away. The 500 Marines were on their own against an invasion force of some 2,500 elite troops from the Japanese Special Naval Landing Force. I told you, the Japanese wanted Wake Island in a bad way, and they were demonstrating it. As the saying goes, every Marine is a rifleman first. So Captain Elrod, being without a plane and being one of the only officers left on the island, took command of a platoon of infantry troops with the assignment to guard and hold the flank. Hank's platoon consisted of pilots, artillerists who no longer had any artillery pieces, and civilians who were living on the island. Armed with machine guns, they set up firing positions and waited for the enemy. And they didn't have to wait long. Not armed with machine guns, but armed with katanas, the Japanese officers led their troops onto the beach, many screaming their war cry. Manzai! In a gallant effort to hold back the enemy, Captain Elrod ordered his Marines to hold their positions and keep firing as long as they could. The civilians served as runners, keeping the Marines' machine guns supplied with ammunition. Hank, with complete disregard for his own safety, stood in full view of the Japanese and laid down wave after wave of suppressive fire with a captured Japanese machine gun. His actions allowed the civilian runners to continue supplying his Marines with ammunition. According to his Medal of Honor citation, quote, Captain Elrod led his men with bold aggressiveness until he fell mortally wounded, end quote. It would take a perfectly placed round from a Japanese gun to bring Hammer and Hank down. The Japanese at this point, who were seemingly attacking from every direction, captured the American trenches and seized control of the island. They would hold it until the war ended. For his actions on Wake Island from 8 to 23 December 1941, Henry Hammer and Hank Elrod was awarded the Medal of Honor and he was posthumously promoted to the rank of major and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Even among other Marines, Henry Elrod is a legend, and it's why 
As I was reading this story, I kept saying he did what? Hank's story is one many haven't heard of before. But we are hoping to change that here at Revealing History by bringing stories like his to light. Another such story is that of Marine aviator and World War II ace, Pappy Boeington. His is another story that will have you saying, he did what? To hear this amazing story, go ahead and click the screen now. And until next time, I'm Dennis Gill for Revealing History.